you will, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. We'll continue our study here in chapter 12. We'll pick up the reading in verse 12. Where the author comes to an application or just an encouragement uh, based on what we've been reading before. He says, Therefore, or wherefore, verse 12, strengthen the hands which hang down the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of, a, of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be a fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he was, had wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he saw it, sought it diligently with tears. Well, as we've been going through this review of Hebrews, uh, or going through this study of the book of Hebrews, one of the things that we need to pick up from scriptures, particularly the more didactic parts of scriptures where we have these truths provided, is that there's, there's not abstracts in truth. I mean, we have these clear truths given to us, and from those truths, clear application. And so, in other words, the Bible gives a clear pathway for the believer to follow. The Bible does not only transform the mind, but it also teaches the heart how to apply those, those transformational truths. In other words, to teach us how to live in a way that pleases our Heavenly Father. And so we need to re resist this pitfall of you know, the, the kind of person that just craves more and more information, but divorces that information from the way we actually live out in the culture. God has given us instructions. He has given us moral instructions in order for us to apply them in practical ways in our homes, here in the church, and in our communities. And so it is one thing to understand. Let me give an example of what I'm trying to talk about. It's one thing to understand the doctrines of grace, but it's quite another to experience, possess the doctrines of grace where they affect your worship, uh, they affect your gratitude and your attitude towards God, your zeal to serve God and to share His glorious gospel. I'll give you a great example. Uh, we went out after church last week and went downtown to hand out tracts and preach the gospel downtown. And I can't tell you how many people were so angry and said, we've already celebrated, because the whole message last week downtown was the resurrection of Jesus. We already celebrated that, they said. I said, well, it seems to me if you celebrated the resurrection, your attitude would be, be a little bit better. Maybe you need to hear it again, so come on back over. When we come to understand the foundational truths given to us to, in the scriptures, it has to impact us in the way we live and conduct ourselves. One made this comment. It is one thing to believe the scriptures are inspired and errant word of God. It's another for the soul to live under the awe of their divine authority, realizing that one day we will be judged by them. It is one thing to be convinced that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is another to surrender to his scepter and live in personal subjection to him. And that's true. It's one thing to believe it. It's another thing to live it out. Or consider this. What does it profit you here this morning to believe that God is omnipotent, but you always... Lean on your own arm. You lean on your own strength rather than his mighty arm. Or think about this. How does it profit you to profess that God is all-knowing but you don't trust his word is sufficient for all your daily actions? What does it profit you to believe that God sees all but your behaviors demonstrate you really think you can hide from God? Children, that's, that's an important one for you to grasp, right? Think about this. If you believe that God sees all, then how do you behave when your parents aren't around? You see, if your behavior changes when your parents are, aren't around, then you really don't believe that God sees all. Never forget this truth. God sees all. He knows all. So you need to live in such a way that you demonstrate this principle. Think about it this way. What profit, what does it profit you to know that without holiness no one shall see the Lord unless you're going to make holiness and possession of holiness your, your chief concern? You see, everything I've just said here this morning is not complicated. It's not really all that profound. It's really self-evident. It's simple when you think about it. But applications of these principles never has anything to do with the intellect. To the unbeliever, for example. The unbeliever, they know all kinds of truths because, in fact, when I share the gospel out in the community, I have unbelievers quoting me all kinds of truths <laughs> from God's word. They just don't have the nature to apply it. Same, there's those who have made a credible profession of faith but yet have not considered what that profession implies and so there's not a full-blown commitment, ultimate commitment and resolve to stand fast before the king no matter what duty calls for. So as we come to chapter 12 here in Hebrews, we come to the wherefores and the therefores in the book. 
In other words, this chapter is driving home some very practical applications for some persecuted Christians. The author has been exhorting these Jewish believers to be completely committed to Christ, turn from Judaism. There's a new covenant that's built on better promises with better priests who offer a better, you know, Jesus Christ is a better priest who offers a better sacrifice. The author has been pointing out the superiority of the new covenant to these readers. And all of this theology has been the foundation to preserve, persevere. It's as though the author is saying, wherefore, get in the race and run it with endurance and you don't stop, you don't fatigue. Dr. Barnhouse said it this way, Hebrews was written to the Hebrews to tell the Hebrews they're no longer Hebrews. In other words, this letter was written to exhort them, flee to Christ, cling to him. Turn from the meagerly shadows and types because they're all pointing to the substance and the reality which is Christ Jesus. Now we come to verse 12 here, therefore or wherefore. Uh, it reminds us that the author is about to make a practical application to those people he is writing to. He just gave an exposition of the truth, the divine chastisement, didn't he? The epistle written to the church, um, you know, when you write, when you think about this, when they're writing to the church, these biblical truths, then they take those truths and they apply it. I mean, you think about the book of Ephesians, first three chapters, great, great you know, foundational truths, theology there, and then the last three chapters deal with some great application because of that theology. And we need to grasp this today. Right? We need to make sure we're making use of these great truths for our gracious, you know, before our gracious Father. It's given for our good, these truths, but it's ultimately given for his glory as well. That's why Jesus would say in Luke 18, take heed, therefore, how you hear. You need to make sure you're coming in here willing to hear, to apply the truths in your heart so that you may go out there and demonstrate the saving power of your Savior to those who are lost and perishing in their sin. So the idea here is that our hearts have to be impacted by what the mind hear, what the mind will hear, what the mind will receive, so that our conduct is properly affected. You see, it's not that you have a reverent demeanor here this morning when receiving the means of grace, right? You need to pay close attention to what you hear so that you may apply them properly. Well, remember, the author is shedding light on a very distressing circumstance that the readers, they are finding themselves in, right? They were under severe persecution by their own countrymen. He reminded them that even though their persecutions were severe, uh, those persecutions, those trials, those, those, those hard providences that they were going for were common amongst all of God's people. The author set before the readers some of the most profound truths which were intended to cheer their spirits and encourage them to obedience. Remember, these Jewish Christians were threatening to go back to Judaism. So what does the author do to encourage them to turn back? He offers the superiority of Christ. Everything about Jesus is better. Don't go back to Judaism because everything better is over here with Christ Jesus. He has given an exposition on divine chastisement. Why? To bring about the peaceful fruits of righteousness. The author has silenced all objections that could be made. And so now the author presses upon them this important truth. When we read this word in verse 12, therefore, he's connected it to everything he said before. The author wants us to consider the consequences of what he written, he's written before. Immediately, it connects with the previous verse. And Go back to verse um, 11 where it says there at the, the end. I want you to just notice this one little word. He says, now no ch chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to who? To those who have been exercised or to those who have been trained by it. Now that word's interesting because the author is alluding again to the Grecian games. In the gymnasium, the instructor, for particular in wrestling and grappling, the instructor would have challenged the youth to combat. Uh, the, the, the one who was training was experienced in this art. They knew how to strike, how to guard, how to wrestle. Many severe blows would uh, be laid upon the combatants there in training. They would receive these blows from him. Now that may sound harsh to you and I. But it was part of, that was part of the training to prepare them to compete in a bigger event. The youth was being prepared for this great event. So they were trained, they were exercised by the trainer who was, had their interest in mind. And those who refused to engage with the trainer, they couldn't receive help from the trainer. So whose fault is it at that moment? You see, it's the young person who refused to submit to the trainer in his training. And it's, his, it's this figure that's being carried out and being carried forward in this next verse. Therefore, you know, if you're not going to be trained for it, you're not going to receive the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight the path for your feet. Now, in other words, the Christian who gives way before the trial, 
who shrinks under affliction, who complains, who sulks, who harbors in bitterness, and we'll deal with that in a couple of sermons, while under the trial, they're not going to bring forth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. If a person faints under the chastisement of God's hand, if their hands become idle, if their legs are uh, no longer able to support them, you're not going to experience the profit from that trial. And so we're being exhorted here in this text to pull ourselves together, to gird up the loins of our minds, to endure hardships like a good soldier. Go to 2 Timothy 2 because some people don't like the idea, well, we're Christians, yeah, but you're a soldier. Paul makes this clear over here in 2 Timothy 2. Pick up the reading in verse 3. He says, You therefore must endure hardship, how? As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You see, if you belong to Christ, you're a soldier. The question is, are you a good one or a bad one? Right? Many of us don't realize that we've been enlisted by the captain of our salvation. And because of that, we fail to see our trials in light of the spiritual warfare going on around us every day. God is preparing us for battles. And here's the thing. If you thought your last battle was tough, it was only preparing you for the next one where he's going to take you even deeper and train you even more. That should be our attitude. Now is the time of our training. So we need to resolve and purpose to stand firm under God's training. Uh, and in order to stand firm, we're going to need to seek grace from God to strengthen our faith, to encourage our, encourage our faith in order to face whatever is going to oppose us. I know Bodhi Bauckham, I'm not sure how he said that, this is exactly how he said it, but he says, if you want to avoid all conflict and opposition, compromise. But if you've already resolved in your mouth, I'm not compromising with unbelievers. I'm going to press the claims of Jesus Christ and get ready for the opposition and prepare for the battle, for the, for, for the warfare. Now, notice, go back to chapter 12 of Hebrews. The wherefore looks back to what was written previously, right? Hebrews 12 opens up with a stirring call for God's people to persevere uh, while executing their Christian duty. But you move forward in your spiritual walk no matter what opposition comes before you. We've been exhorted uh, there earlier in the chapter to run with patience or with perseverance the race that was set before us. And so the author anticipates an objection. We are sorely being oppressed. We're being tempted to renounce our faith. We're being hounded by our unbelieving countrymen. I mean, you remember how Acts 9 starts out, Saul still breathing threats upon the Christians. This is real stuff here that they're going through. But it's to that kind of objection the author responding, you know, responds. He says, consider your master who went before you. You're on the same pathway that he was on. The author further reminds those who are reading this letter, bear in mind, you haven't experienced a martyr's death yet, so you keep on persevering. Furthermore, you're losing sight of the scriptural exhortation, my son, do not despise the chastening hand of God. And so this leads the author to present this beautiful doctrine of divine chastisement, and we looked at that. But what we need to remember is the trials uh, that we're going through, even as the children of God, um, this is not divine punishment, it's divine chastisement, discipline training for us we always remember this the rod of our heavenly father is never yielded in wrath to his children but it's a manifestation of his tender love that's what the text says this is a demonstration of god's love towards us our duty then as children is to endure his chastising and and if you're going to you know if you're if you're going without chastisement what does the the bible say then you're illegitimate you don't even belong to it so that ought to wake us up right now, in order for us to understand these verses that he comes to in verse 12, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight the paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Now, in order for us to understand these two verses here, we need to understand, one, that the Christian life was likened to a race earlier, and number two, that the author is using language from Isaiah 35. All right? If you get those two concepts, you're going to understand what the author is saying here. The author is saying... Don't get tired while in the race. The author's going back to the race metaphor that he started the chapter with. And the author's reminding us of this principle taught, for example, and you know, it's all throughout the New Testament, but 2 Corinthians 4, 16 says this, For which cause we think not, but, through our, but though our outward man perish, yet inward man is being renewed, how? Day by day. Even though each of us are perishing outwardly, and the older I get, the more I feel it, but inwardly in Christ, we are being renewed. 
It's the, as one said, even though people get old on the outside, sometimes the youngest people you'll meet are the oldest physically. But they have had the most years of being renewed every day in the Spirit of God. And that's true. You ever seen some older fellows? There's a guy down there that ministers with us. He's in his mid seventies, and he runs up and down that hill uh, to get up there to get on, get up there, and, and, and reach out to those mothers and fathers. But this is a guy, although outwardly he looks old, inwardly he's renewed day by day. He has not had this attitude of now I'm in my twilight years, I can sit back and retire. No, there's no retirement for the Christian soldier. We continue to press the claims of Jesus Christ, and as long as he has, gives us life and breath. I always remember my Aunt Lily, uh, before she died there in the nursing home, uh, wasn't able to get out of her bed. But if you walked in that room, you're going to hear about Jesus. It doesn't matter where we find ourselves. We can always proclaim and continue to press the claims of Jesus Christ no matter where we find ourselves. Now, this is not only in the, uh, you know, uh, not only in the, uh, old, uh, the New Testament. The Old Testament says this in Isaiah, remember? But those that wait on the Lord shall renew what? Their strength. They shall mount up like wings with eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's a promise from God. So from the book of Hebrews, it appears that these Jewish Christians were growing weary. And this is an important principle that we're getting from the author. So when I meet people who are poor in the mouth, um, they want to have this pity party attitude for their circumstances. And a lot of times what they're wanting me to do is encourage them to wallow in their self-pity. But uh, that's not what the author of Hebrews is teaching us here. That's not the principle that's being set forth here. If you ever see me uh, wanting to have a pity party or tell you and poor Matthew about how hard my life is, uh, you go back to this principle and say, look, you pick your arms up, get some strength in your knees, and you keep persevering on the race that God has given to you. In fact, the author's been doing this kind of encouragement all throughout this letter. Uh, let me just give you a couple examples. I mean, really, you think about it. Go back to chapter 10 here in Hebrews. The whole community of believers really suffering from this kind of apathy. They were allowing the persecution of the enemy to discourage some of them. Uh, but, I mean, and, and it was even affecting, it appears, their, their church attendance. And so notice what he says in verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so really incredible when you think about the context here, right, that he would say this. Some of these people didn't come home when they went to church. But the author doesn't let them off the hook. He says, you still go. Why? Well, so you can provoke one another to love and good works. Now, some people have the gift of provocation, but not in a good sense. What we need is the gift of provocation to love and good works. And we can't do that if we don't come and gather together. I mean, you think about what's going on in the first century. The persecution had taken a toll on some of these believers, so they began to turn back to Judaism. Um, some stopped attending regularly. And here's the thing, let me just say this, you can't spend your time with unbelievers and it not take a toll on you. So the author hammers these readers and, and says, you know what, you need to stay true to your call, call your call to Christ, and make sure um, you're about the business of stirring one another up to love and good works. Listen, when somebody's being persecuted, someone's being hounded, one of the best things that we as Christians can do is encourage that person to love and good works. So go back to chapter 12. The author just finished, once again, this great section on discipline. The discipline is not designed to slow you down, but to train you to continue in the race. Think about it this way. If you're an athlete and you're going to train for a track meet, then you have to discipline yourself or you're not going to be any good there in the race. I mean, can you imagine any of y'all in here training to run a mile? But I said, listen, let's go out there. Let's just go run a mile real quick. That's going to be pretty hard for a lot of us, right? Why? Because we haven't trained ourselves to do this. You see, the training is not designed to slow you down, slow the runner down, but rather to give you endurance to run the race to the finish line. And we've all seen a race. How do you know when a runner's getting tired? He drops his arms. His legs begin to get weak. <coughs> the arms help give rhythm to your stride if you're trying to run, right? But when you drop your arms, you can break that rhythm just by the weight of your arms. And so when you see the arms drop, you know the runner is getting tired. He's having trouble. The second thing that happens when a runner gets tired is his knees begin to wobble. I can remember uh, one year in high school, I, I decided to run for cross country because I thought he'd get me in shape for soccer. And boy, that first time, first few days I went out there, I mean, I know what that feeling is like. So what do you do when you, you fatigue and you can't just, you don't think you can go on anymore? You have this graphic picture of a fatigued runner whose arms are drooping, his knees are wobbling. And if a runner begins to focus on his fatigue, you know what, he's not gonna ever finish. He won't finish. 
The only thing that a runner can do at this point to finish is he has to look to the finish line. He has to look at the finish line and say, I am going to make it. He has to remind himself that there's one who is cheering me on to, to make it. There's one who has secured the victory. I know I can make it. There are times in your Christian life when your arms are going to start to droop, your knees are going to wobble, and you don't know if you can put one foot in front of the other. But this is where you have to look to the finish line. The one who has already been in this race, the one who has finished this race, the one who conquered death, he is cheering you on. He is cheering you on because he secured that victory for you. And you need to remind yourself of this reality, especially when you become spiritually exhausted. So you need to remember that the one who conquered the grave, he's cheering you there. He has secured your victory. Now with that illustration firmly planted in your mind, where did this author even get this analogy from? Well, turn back over to Isaiah 35. Go back to Isaiah 35. He's using language from one of the prophets, and this is what the prophet was doing back in Isaiah, Isaiah back in his day. He was encouraging the remnant. You had those who were unfaithful, they're being punished. The remnant are going to be carried off into exile, but he is encouraging the remnant. Don't give up. All throughout this letter, there's a message to those who are being judged, and then there's the message of hope and encouragement to the remnant. Look at verse 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and the blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. And then here it is. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Now this is interesting. It's a wonderful promise given to us by Isaiah. The wilderness, as we all understand, can be a very solitary, bleak type place. But here we have the great promise that the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice. And so this chapter is a promise of what things are going to be like when the Messiah comes. When the Messiah comes, he's going to institute his own kingdom. And when he comes, his kingdom will begin to bring forth fruit to those dry and fruitless lands. At the time that Isaiah wrote his letter, the Gentile nations had long been in the wilderness condition, bringing no fruit to God. But when the kingdom of God comes, many of them began to receive the gospel with joy. Do you remember in Acts 8.8 8, when the gospel was preached there in Samaria, that despised area? There's great joy in the city, Acts 8.8 8 says. You see, those who sat in darkness, when Jesus comes upon the scene, they saw a great light. And so Isaiah saw a lot of discouragement in the children of Israel. Uh, you see, uh, they're down in the mouth, uh, they're pouting, they're probably complaining, they're troubled. But what does Isaiah do? He says, cheer up. The kingdom of God will come, is coming. The desert will blossom with joy. And in verse 3, we see our verse. He says, strengthen the weak hands, shore up those weak knees. And this is where the author of the Hebrews gets this from. He pulls out a speech of encouragement from the Old Testament. He's saying, cheer up, keep persevering. There is victory ahead. What stops the Jewish persecution against the Christians in that day? 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem. You don't really read about the Jews persecuting them. This is all fulfillment of what he said in Matthew 24. In Matthew 23, remember, he lays out the indictment against the Jews and the persecution of the prophets, even Jesus himself, and what they're going to do to his followers. And so after the indictment, Jesus lays down the judgment there in Matthew 24. And in 70 AD, we see the destruction of Jerusalem. And we don't really read much about the Jews persecuting the Christians after that. Well, Look what he says in verse 4 here. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Why? Why? Behold, your God will come with vengeance and with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. What is Isaiah saying? He's saying hang in there. Why? Because your Lord will come with vengeance. He's going to pay recompense. He's going to deliver you. He's going to save you. And this is not just a message for the saints in Isaiah's day. This is not just a message to the saints there in the days of, of the Hebrews. But this is a message that we can all claim. So let me ask you this. Do you hear about the great promises? You come here, you hear about the great promises, you hear about the great encouragements from the Word of God. But then you walk outside the door and you start thinking about, oh, I got clothes to wash. I got to get ready for my kids' lessons tomorrow. I got a lot to do at work tomorrow. And all of a sudden, your arms begin to droop. Your knees get weak again. Why is that? Well, you're not focusing on the remedy. The remedy is to get your eyes off your routine and focus on the fact that God is renewing you day by day. How, how do I mean by that? Well, did God get you through last week? Did you finish your chores? Did you finish all the stuff that was dragging your arms down and wobbling your knees last week? Well, guess what? 
He's going to be there and get you through this week too. So let's don't walk out the door with our arms hanging down and our knees getting weak, spiritually speaking. We're going to know where God's going to renew us. Whatever he's putting in front of me, he's going to renew us. See, I look back and I don't, I don't have any idea how Marie finishes all she did for the past 20-something years with all these children. And you'd have to know my children to really understand that. But that's what I remind Marie when she says, how am I going to do what i got to do this week? I said, well, I guess the same way you did the last 20 years. The one who renewed you for 20 years, he'll renew you next week too. We've got to start thinking about this because when we focus on the arms drooping, the knees getting wobbly, we're not going to finish the race. Okay? I hope you see what the author is doing, and I get it. It's hard to make the comparison when they're really getting persecuted and hammered. But those same truths that carried these believers through to persevere are the same truths that are going to get you to persevere as well. Now go back to Hebrews 12 because I want you to see something here. Now this is not a message just to encourage you to focus on you, your arms and your knees. Look at what's here. Now the authorized version says this, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the knees, the feeble knees. You know what it doesn't talk about? It doesn't really say your hands or your knees. So that implies something to me. I'm not only to lift up my hands and my knees, i got to look out and encourage you as well. And you do the same. It's something that needs to be stated because we're all guilty of this. We see other Christians who are struggling. Their hands are weak. Their knees are wobbly. What do we do? Well, you know, I, no wonder. Look at the choices they make, right? We, we can beat a Christian down better than anybody else. We can eat our own better than anybody else. But this verse tells me, no, when I see someone whose knees are wobbling, and I see someone whose arms are hanging down, I need to come over there and encourage them. And here's the thing. It is a blessing to have someone to come along and encourage you. Or think about those because of their commitment to Christ, their suffering. It's a blessing to have another Christian to come along and give you that word of encouragement. Blessed are those who are persecuted for Christ's sake. And they say all kind of false things about you. We need to have that word of encouragement in our mouth to give to those who are actually living out the life of Christ that he's called you to live out, and now we're getting opposition. And this is what the author of Hebrews is doing. He's encouraging his readers with this great analogy, not only to look after their own walk, but to look out for the walk of others. One Ruth said it this way, we're in the business of not only getting our, on our, get our own knees going and our own arms pumping, but setting an example to others who are lifting them up and getting them going in the race as well. I mean, isn't that what you see? Isn't that one of the great takeaways of Pilgrim's Progress? What is it? When Christian is going along and he's getting down, God always sends someone there to pick him up and get him back on the track, right? He gets diverted. He, wants to, he gets all down in the mouth. And God will send him an encourager to come along. We need someone. When we see someone struggling, we, need, we want to be the ones that come up and say, don't quit. Come on. Don't stop now. We want to see ourselves and other Christians finish the race well. Look at verse 13. And notice this first clause. And make straight paths for your feet. So the author's going to take this a little further. He says, make the path straight for your feet. So what does that mean? I think it means stay in your lane. Right? You ever see a race where runners start collapsing in another's lane? It can get ugly pretty quick. Stay in your lane. Make straight the path for your feet. Now I think we can all agree that there are many Christians who are running a race. But on each side they see the distractions on each side of the track. And they get sidetracked, right? There's the trinkets that this world has to offer. You start taking your focus off the finish line. You begin to run a torturous path. You begin to wobble to and fro. And if you're always taking your directions from the world rather than God's word, then, then you're not going to be running a straight line, but you're going to be running side to side. Sometimes you'll be going backwards. The world is always there beside the track trying to pull your focus. And here's the problem. When you begin to wobble, you can make others wobble as well in the race. We need to watch our walk, not only for our own sake, but also we need to remember there's others watching us as well. We don't want to cause other believers to stumble. And this is the problem I think we have in the modern church. We only think my sin impacts me. My sin is my business, not your business. No, but my sin impacts you as well. And so when others fall, others are watching. And as fathers in particular, we need to remember this truth. Our children are watching us. They are looking to us and how we will take God's word and apply it. They're watching to see if we're going to be consistent with what we teach or if we're going to be hypocrites. The author wants us to walk a straight, smooth path. Proverbs 4.25 says this, Let your eyes look right on and let your eyelids look straight before you. So when you look straight, you walk straight. And when you look, begin to look to the left or the right, you begin to wobble off course. And the idea here is that 
You're not looking over the edge and seeing what's going on in the world. You're not seeking guidance from the world. You're not seeking direction from the world. There's no blessings tied to the ungodly. Isn't that what Psalm 1 says? Blessed are those who do not seek counsel from the ungodly. And what's one of the biggest problems in the church today? Professing Christians sending their children to the pagans to raise and train them and wonder why they're not coming back to the church. We don't want ungodly counsel. We don't want ungodly advice. We don't want ungodly philosophies, those that are anti-Christian to the core, giving us guidance. So when I read this word here in verse 13, this word translated path in the Greek refers to tracks left by wheels. And to drive the analogy home, this means that not only are we follow those tracks who have gone before us, but we're leaving tracks. One of the best things, for example, about studying church history is we can look how other Christians went before us and dealt with difficult situations, how they responded to difficult days. What did they do when they began to get weary? I mean, go back and read, um, children, uh, the pilgrims who came over here. Y'all realize when they came across, when they stepped onto the land, it wasn't a big turkeys and a big feast. Many didn't make it that first year. Many didn't make it at all. Uh, they would, how they responded to that hard providence uh, would be encouraging for us to follow in their footsteps. But let me just give you the point. They, they praised God. They trusted God. They prayed to God. They never took their focus off of God. They didn't focus on their circumstance. They didn't let their arms become weary and their knees become weak to the point where they were wanting to turn back and go back to Europe. They turned to God and they persevered because they kept their eyes focused on the prize. Now, when we read this word path, let me just take some time this morning. When it says make straight paths for your feet, we understand the Bible teaches us very clearly there are two paths. There's the broad path, there's the narrow path. There's the straight path, there's the crooked path. There are only two paths the Bible teaches. So let's look at that this morning. Proverbs 4. Go back over to the Proverbs. Pick up the reading. Uh, let's just pick up in verse 14. It says, Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they do not sleep unless they have done evil, and their sleep is taken away unless they make someone fall. For they eat, bread of the, they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is like a shining sun that shines even brighter into the perfect day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Well, wisdom keeps us from standing in the pathways of unrighteousness. So do you possess wisdom? You see, we do not walk in the ways of the wicked. We don't sit in the seat of the scorner if we're wise. There are two ways of life that a person must choose between. And in this chapter, we have this recurring theme of two roads, the road of life and the road of destruction. Uh, this is a construct that the Bible uses over and over again, a path, a road, a way of life. Turn to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. Look at verse 17. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who keeps his way preserves his soul. So the highway of the upright is, is a reference to how one lives their life. The upright choose a course of life that avoids evil. And if you keep your way... Proverbs says, you'll keep your soul, you'll preserve your soul. The book of Proverbs exhorts us to take a look at what we're doing. Look at the kind of life we are living. In other words, where are you headed? One of the biggest signs of the foolishness of our age is that people rarely think about the consequences. In other words, they don't think about where their pathway is taking them. They don't live as though they do have moral obligations to keep. They don't live as though their path of life is going to a destination. Most people we know live in a way that gives them the most satisfaction, the most pleasure for the moment. And so day after day, they live with no self-regard um, for their neighbor, for their creator, how their selfish thinking, their actions impact someone else. And that choice, according to the testimony of the Scriptures, has consequences. The book of Proverbs reminds us to look at the pathway we're on because the path we're on is taking us somewhere. So where are you going? Hold your place here in Proverbs. Go back over to Isaiah 35 because later on in the chapter he makes reference to this as well. In Isaiah 35, just pick up the reading in verse 8. A highway shall be there and a road 
and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and, the, and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing and shall flee away. Well, this is a beautiful prophecy about the day of salvation. On this day, the righteous, the redeemed, will walk upon this highway of holiness, this way. And so Proverbs reminds us to pay attention to the highway of life. In other words, make sure you find it, and when you find it, you stay on it. And when you get on it, find companions that will help you stay there. The prophet is saying there's a highway of life that belongs to the righteous. For those who say all I need is Jesus, I don't need to concern myself with all this wisdom and all this stuff about the way of life. Forget that Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. There's only one path to the Father. It's found in Jesus Christ, his works. That gives us access to the Father. But Jesus has taught us as redeemed individuals how to walk, how to live, how to stay on this path by his grace. And so all the teachings, all the doctrines taught in the New Testament become known as what? The way of righteousness. Turn over to uh, 2 Peter. <coughs> Hold your place in Proverbs. We're going to come back. But I want you to see how the New Testament picks up this theme. 2 Peter 2. Now, this is talking about apostates that turn. They've seen and they've tasted. But notice just what he says. In verse 21, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it in turn from holy commandment delivered to them. You ever met somebody who at one time they seemed to be excited? They showed forth, they professed, it just seemed like the Lord was doing a work there. And then something happens in their life, they get discouraged, whatever it is, and then the next thing you know, they just turn and abandon everything. I'm not talking about they go from they left your church and went to another church. What I'm saying is they just abandoned the faith. He says, you know what? It would have been better for them to have never known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn from the holy commandments delivered to them. Well, turn to Acts 16. I want you to see this phrase that's used over and over again in the New Testament. Acts 16. Look at verse 17. This girl followed us, followed Paul and us, and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now hold that thought. Turn to chapter 18, turn over, and look at verse 26. I just want you to see how this word way is used. Look at this in verse 26, where he says, So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Well, go back to verse 25. Notice this. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, all you've got to do is take your cross-reference, and it's going to hit you pretty quickly. When you do this, you're going to see there's this common Christian speech referred to the teachings of Christ as the way, the way of righteousness. Christians are in the way. Christians are in the way of life. And this is why not only are the teachings known as the way, but the church is actually addressed as the way. Go to Acts 9. Let me just show you this real quick. Acts 9 says this in verse 2. And asked for letters. So this is Saul of Tarsus. He asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any of who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He doesn't say, hey, look, if I find anybody of the church, he says if I find anyone of the way. So they're synonymous. They're used both together. People, Christians who are in the church are people of the way. Go to Acts 19. Acts 19. Look at verse 9. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Look, drop down to verse 23. And about the time there arose a great commotion about what? The way. 
Go to chapter 22, Acts 22. And look at verse 4. I persecuted, this is Paul recounting what he was like when he saw of Tarsus. I persecuted this way to death, to the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. Let me just do one more, and I think we've made the point. Acts 24, look at verse 22. But when Felix heard these things, having a more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings. But in the earliest days of the Christian church, Christians were considered the people of the way. In other words, there's a pathway that leads people home. They were known as the people of the way because they preached the way of life. They preached that Jesus was the only way to God the Father. And since there is a path that leads to life, then one would naturally think there's a path that leads to destruction. And there is. The Bible teaches that as well. Go back to Proverbs 2. Because I want you to see the contrast here between the two pathways. The author of Proverbs wants us to know that there is a pathway to, of, of wisdom. And so, I just wanted you to see, it's not just some Old Testament concept. These Old Testament constructs are brought into the New Testament. But go to Proverbs 2. Proverbs 2. Look at verse 7. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. You see, if you have wisdom, you're going to understand every good path. This tells me that wisdom makes us walk on a certain road, a certain way. In other words, wisdom governs our lives and how we behave. Drop down to verse 19. None who go to her, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness, for the upright will dwell in the land, and the blameless will remain in it. So notice here there's a pathway that leads to peace and harmony with our Creator. Look at chapter 3 and verse 6, where it says, In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall what? Direct your paths. Someone's directing your paths. The question is who? Who's directing the pathway you're on now? Some, some people... It's your gut feeling, whatever feel right at the moment. Some people go and find counsel from people who they think are smarter, wealthier, or whatever than they are. Uh, some allow the most wicked people to allure them and attract them off. That's what he was dealing with in chapter 2 about the, the woman you don't want to go meet, right? So there's always someone leading you. Who is leading and guiding you? Children don't underestimate the kind of music you listen to, the type of entertainments you, you entertain, right? Are they leading you to rejoice in Christ? Is it leading you to stay on the narrow path? Or is your entertainment pulling you away? Look at Proverbs 3.23. Then you will walk safely in your way, and your foot will not stumble. Proverbs 4.11 says, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right path. Proverbs 4.18 says this, But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines even brighter into the perfect day. So, the author presents to us this pathway of righteousness, but the author also presents to us the path of the wicked, the foolish, and those pathways have to be avoided. Go back to Proverbs 2. Proverbs 2, look at verse uh, 12. Let's just pick up the reading there. To deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in perversity of the wicked, those ways are crooked. And those are devious in their paths. So the Bible teaches us there's really two pathways. Go to, uh, go to Proverbs 4. Look at verse um, 18. Oh, I'm sorry, not verse 18. Verse 14. Excuse me. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. So there are two paths. The Bible's trying to get us to think about where we're going. Every road takes us to a destination, and the Bible's trying to get us to see one path leads to life, the other path leads to death. And they're polar opposites. So when we come to our text here in Proverbs 4.18, he says, But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines even brighter into the perfect day. I mean, this is not a complicated concept. It only becomes you know what makes walking on the paths complicated? Is when you try to walk on the narrow and the broad path at the same time. And you try to rationalize that. That's what makes it difficult. 
The modern world refuses to accept this dichotomy that the Bible puts in front of us. You've met these individuals, and many of these individuals have been well educated by our secular universities who think like this, who think that there's multiple paths out there for men and women to choose between. They don't believe there's only two paths, and those same people don't believe there are absolute truths. They like the fact that morality is vague, and they do this because if morality is vague, then really no one is wrong. And so they refuse to submit to the holy will of God. But what they forget is that this God who taught us how to live through his word is always watching. And since God is always watching, the Proverbs tells us make sure you're on the right path. So, for example, think about the moral relativist that's out there. They're going to be shocked on the day of judgment because you know what they're going to realize? God does judge by a standard. The standard is his law. And they're going to realize they've been wrong the entire time. But more than that, they're not wrong, but all those who listen to them are wrong and they've all been led astray as well you see God's not going to have a problem judging and separating the sheep from the goat right so think about it this way we've gotten so bad in this this land we don't even look for honorable people to lead us anymore right think about who we put in our public office think about who we allow to entertain us all the different perverts that are out there all culture just assumes as everyone that's on the crooked path they're okay and so our culture ridicules moral absolutes. Why do they try to have the Ten Commandments, the God's law of moral standalized, removed out of the public arena? They don't want a moral absolute. Think about the hypocrisy of those who want to bring in reforms to this land. Think about those on the left who deny any kind of moral absolutes, but they're always trying to reform something in, this, in, in our land, right? To bring in any kind of reform means one idea is better than the other, right? Isn't that the basis of what they're trying to tell us? So when the relativist challenges us not to judge, for example, homosexuality or the abortionists, because you don't really know if that's wrong, you always challenge them with the absolutely, are you absolutely sure that this is not wrong? Right? The consistent relativist has to respond by saying there is no consistent, unchanging morality. And the point there is that he cannot be sure of his own point of view, because it may be changing. The relativist position is an impotent position to start from. The relativist worldview, um, I mean, let me ask you this. Based on the relativist worldview, why shouldn't the stronger beat up the weaker? Why shouldn't? Since there are more absolutes than in their world, anything goes. Furthermore, relativism is an incoherent system. They're absolutely sure there's no absolutes. Really, relativism is legalism and self-righteousness in disguise. Think about it this way. How does the relativist know there are no rules? Well, they say there are no rules, but that's the problem. He just made a rule. And so what he does is he tries to live at least by one rule. There are no rules. But what is the source of his claim? Well, it can't be God because they're always trying to get away from him. And since the relativist is not all-knowing, it can't be from their experience. When the relativist says there are no rules, what is he actually doing? He's putting himself in the role of God. He's trying to play God at that moment. He declares that there are no rules. But when you meet these people, they actually have rules in which they live by. But they're not rules from the scripture. They're not revelation from God. Their arbitrary rulemaking comes from their own feelings. So they actually become the most legalistic, self-righteous individuals you'll ever meet. You want to meet a legalist? Go down to the abortion mill. Go down there and watch the pro aborts try to support baby murder. They're going to become very legalistic against the Christians who stand in support of life. Now, it's absurd, and, and, and you'll lose IQ points trying to figure out why they think the way they think. But nevertheless, they demonstrate that they are some of the most legalistic, self-righteous people who stand on the planet. Think about it this way. They accuse us of harassing women. So what do they do? They harass women who don't agree with them. They violate their own standard every day. We were down there sharing the truth uh, Friday night, handing out tracts downtown. And one of the things, one of the themes was, we cannot make peace with baby murder. So we were hitting the community down there about this this issue. And one woman who didn't like our signs screamed out, "Have respect for life." Now, have, think about the absurdity of that position. But that's where the moral relativist is led to stupidity and absurdity. Well, let me move on. We're running out of time. What we want is the Word of God. The Word of God gives us a clear standard. The Word of God tells us there's a road that leads to life and a road that is straight, a road that is narrow. And so when I look here, for example, at Proverbs 4, 11, look at this. I have taught you the way of wisdom. This is a father speaking to his son. 
I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. These are not meandering paths. These are not crisscross paths. These are not paths that double back. No, these are not contradictory paths. What they are, they're straight paths. They are right morally, and so they're going to be preferred over all other paths. But look at the path of the wicked. Go back to verse 19. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. They don't understand. They don't even know what they're tripping over. If you walk in the paths of life, there's no stumbling for you. Indeed, those who walk in the way of the wicked are lost, and they're confused because they walk in darkness. They refuse to allow the light of God's word to guide them. And so notice the beautiful imagery of verse 18. But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines even brighter unto the perfect day. If you've ever driven east before the sun comes up, you know what he's saying. As you go east, as that sun begins to crack over the horizon, as it goes up and up and up, he gets brighter and brighter and things get clearer and clearer, doesn't it? Well, that's what it's like when you walk on the pathways of righteousness. Things that were confusing to the one who started that journey years ago becomes more and more clear as they stay on that pathway of righteousness. Remember, this is not hard. This is not you know, trying to you know, solve a differential equation problem. This is a moral problem. Those who struggle with what I'm saying this morning, and you think it's hard and difficult, intellectually speaking, it's because you're trying to do the impossible. No one can serve two masters. If you're trying to put one foot on the broad path, one foot in the narrow path, it is going to be very complicated for you to weather these issues out. But once you purpose to stay on the narrow path, it's not intellectually challenging at that point. Well, Proverbs 4.25 says this, Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. This makes me think that uh, you know, maybe we need some of those horse blinders, spiritually speaking, put on us. And what do we need to be binding our eyes with? The Word of God. The Bible is teaching us to look straight ahead. Don't glance over. Don't look back to see what the wicked are doing. Don't become distracted. We see this attitude. This should be our attitude in life. Don't compromise. Don't rationalize. Don't become the spiritual relativist and deviate a little here to the right to the left. No, stay straight. Don't take an off-ramp. Don't go back. And that's the whole point of what the author of Hebrews is telling these persecuted Christians. Do not go back. Once you put your hand to the plow, Jesus says what? Don't you look back. Well, the road of life is a crucial theme in the Bible. It's certainly important in the book of Proverbs. And I believe this is what the author of Hebrews is doing. He's borrowing this type of language. And he says, make your pathway straight. Let me just end with this in Matthew 7. You're familiar with it, but it's good for you to see it again. Matthew 7. Look at verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate that is broad, the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. The Bible's clear that the road you choose is important, because the road you choose is taking you to a destination. So you're going to have to ask yourself this question. I can't answer it for you. Where are you headed? What road are you on right now? Okay. You need to surround yourself with individuals who are going to encourage you to stay on this narrow path. The wisest man who ever lived is telling you the road to life is straight. Trust Christ. He's the straight and narrow way. He's the only way. And so when I come to Hebrews 12, 12, and 13, I see the picture. Sometimes it's easy to get weary. Your arms drop. Your knees wobble. That's where you got to keep your eyes focused on the finish line and keep your eyes focused on the one who is cheering you along the way, who secured your, your victory, your success. Hebrews 12, 13 also reminds me that while I'm on this pathway, you know, one of the things that makes you tired is when you run needlessly in the wrong direction. And so you need to stay on the straight path. So let me just end here. Lord willing, we're going to pick up our study next week here. But don't forget, we need this encouragement. This is a reminder that we all need to encourage one another. You know, it's easy to see a weary Christian walking along the wayside and just shake your head and say, oh, how sad. Remember what the author of Hebrews is doing here. He's talking to people who are really going through a hard time, and he's encouraging them. He's pointing them back. Focus your attention on what matters, where the real source of your strength, where you're going to be renewed day by day. Those who wait upon the Lord, they renew their strength. And so we need to be that encouragement. It's easy to knock somebody down. It's easy to talk about them. It's easy to just you know keep whatever, ignore them. No, we need to find those weary Christians that are having a hard time and just send them an over encouragement. Come along beside them. Encourage them along the way. So may God grant this church the grace to stay on the path, 
And remember how we walk on this path matters not only for our own life, but to those who are walking with us. We want to make sure we stay on the path and that we finish the race well to God's glory. Father, we thank you once again for your word is clear. It's not ambiguous at all. Lord, what makes it ambiguous is when we try to muddy your word with worldly (coughs) philosophies and concepts, compromise. Lord, uh, speak to your children today. Speak to me. Continue to encourage me uh, to stay on this pathway. Lord, uh, may I be an encouragement to those that I come into uh, contact with, those that we minister with here in this church and outside, those that are here that have their businesses and they know other Christians that might be going through a hard time. Lord, may this just be a reminder just to be an encouragement to one another. So, Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who has gone before us. He has led the way. He has set the path. Help us to stay close to him. Let us submit to your word because your word says you will guide us in our path. Lord, may we always be close to you, willing to follow you no matter where you take us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.